I think we also tend to sort of stereotype OPEC being the oil people. Actually, if you look at Saudi, UAE, some of the countries that are leading OPEC, they have, one, they have the best energy strategies globally. You know, if you look at how their energy strategies compare, the use of gas, renewables, hydrogen, mm -hmm. the way they're consuming their energy, they're way ahead of many Western countries. So when you think about OPEC in a sort of energy strategy perspective, I tend to think about how they're managing their energy strategy in terms of how they consume as much as how they provide stability of oil. But you're right. I mean, in terms of this idea of a breakup, I think the price war in 2020 has left people scarred that there's going to be some sort of, if prices go down, they're going to sort of all of a sudden fall apart. When anything, they've done exactly the opposite. They've been very disciplined. They have basically focused on managing quotas. Now, the big theme is how do they increase spare capacity, which I think is where some of the arguably tensions have come. When you open up that, when you talk about spare capacity, you're sort of opening up Pandora's box. But I think they've aligned that quite well in how they've reasserted themselves with you know, efficacy and essentially policing people who say they have it and people who don't. Uh, what about uh, the, uh, the meeting that's coming up and yeah. the yeah. expectation of voluntary cuts uh, from Saudi Arabia uh, essentially being rolled over into August? And some people are saying that it'll get rolled over into September if uh, you don't see that sort of impetus uh, on the demand side from China, from the likes of India. India, of course, is doing quite well, but China is the main story here. China, China demand did have a very good month, but you're absolutely right. If, you know, we, we started this year, we've been very bullish the last three years. We turned bearish this year, which was quite unpopular because we sort of said super cycles on hold. Uh, now we're neutral and we're looking at signs. One of the biggest signs for me is because Saudi call it so well in looking at demand, they see everything. The moment they don't, they basically don't roll over. It means the QR on the building is so long, the nominations are so strong, that it means demand has to be good. So it's sort of a retroactive way to think about when to think about buying the sector. You think about it when the Saudis are saying to you, look, there's no reason for me to cut anymore. I'm actually quite happy. Getting look at the queue, look at the queue around my building. Why would I do that, right? <laughs> but with that said, um, I think at this point, with the venture is still quite weak, I, do, I don't think the venture have come down enough mm -hmm. for that to for that to stop. So rollover is essentially the base case. Mm -hmm. But I think of the next few months, I'm looking very carefully. When people ask me, what do you think of demand? I say, actually, it's so hard. We're in demand discovery. Yeah. Look at the Saudis. Look at what they're doing, and they'll yeah. tell you how demand is because they've nailed it in terms of how they've managed the process through the years. Christian, I'm completely out of time. Yeah. What about the pricing? <laughs> what about 12 months and per season at 35? Where do you see oil prices? I think price could ultimately double over the next two years. Um, so it's pretty much diametrically opposite to prices falling. And, and by the way, on, on, on a low price environment, look at the marginal cost. Shale is not getting cheaper. Productivity is falling. Things are getting expensive. If you want to know what where the, the, the floor in prices, look at the marginal cost producer. So for $35 to play out, that means shale, Production is falling by about a million barrels.